Welcome to another episode of The League of Biblical Enthusiasts. So I've given quite a bit of thought to where should we go from here? How do we start? As a matter of fact, I've been preparing a class entitled The History of the Bible, and I thought, how much simpler could it be? Let's start there. Here we have for us, in our own language, a Bible. What is the story of how it came to be? What were the early languages? Upon what material did the early biblical writers write? And so today we're going to do a simple uh, look into ancient writing and what surfaces were used to write upon in the ancient world. So we're really covering the material history of the text. So let's talk about it. Number one, stone. We are familiar, of course, with the Rosetta Stone, 1799. France entered Egypt, and many scientists and archaeologists went along, and they found the Rosetta Stone. This particular artifact was our key to understanding hieroglyphics. So we're familiar with the Rosetta Stone. However, there are many biblical um, materials written upon stone. Just a couple of examples would be the Tel Dan Stele. Now, a stele is simply an inscription intended as a monument. And in Tel Dan, Israel, was discovered this stele, which has perhaps the earliest reference to the house of David, Beit David, that we have. It's currently stored at the British Museum. We also are familiar with the Siloam inscription found inside the Siloam Tunnel, which now is in East Jerusalem. The construction of the tunnel was described on this inscription. It's dated to the 8th century before Christ uh, due to its um, handwriting style. Secondly, we have ostraca, that's the plural of ostracon, singular, which simply are potsherds, broken pieces of pottery that were intended as casual temporary communications to, to, to write upon things like receipts from purchases, a list of names, exercises from schools. We have also, thirdly, clay tablets. When softened, a stylus would write upon the clay tablet surface. Think of, for example, the cuneiform tablets from Samaria and Babylonia. We have, fourthly, papyrus. Papyrus is made from the marrow of the papyrus plant that grows along the Nile River and its tributaries. The plants will be stripped, laid horizontally and vertically, pressed together, dried and smoothed, and that will be used as a writing surface. We have many thousands of biblical papyri today. One major find was made in the late 19th century with two young Oxford scholars, Grenfell and Hunt are their last names, they came upon thousands upon thousands of papyri in the sands of Egypt, Oxyrhynchus, Egypt. Those papyri are now stored, most of them, in the British Museum. There are so many that even to this day, they are uncatalogued and many are untranslated. And you can go online and join the uh, Oxyrhynchus project, whereby you can sign up to translate some of the hitherto untranslated papyri. We have fifth, parchment or vellum and vellum. Parchment is simply a general term for animal skins prepared for writing, usually from calf, goat, or sheep. Now, vellum is a higher quality form and higher quality preparation of the animal skin. And there are many, many biblical manuscripts survive today as parchment, uh, parchment. We think of one example, the primary example of Codex Sinaiticus housed in the British Museum. It is a complete copy of the Bible on fine prepared parchment, 
Some think it might even be one of the 50 uh, Bibles that was commissioned by Constantine the Great around the early 4th century. Then we have six, metal, lead, bronze, and copper. We have many examples of lead curse tablets in the ancient world. Recently, Scott Stripling and his team discovered a lead curse tablet at Mount Ebal in Israel, where they claim contains the earliest name of God, the earliest name of the God of Israel, Yahweh, and that the text itself is the earliest form of Hebrew writing that we have, and it pushes back our knowledge of Hebrew writing hundreds of years. This is very controversial, and other scholars say, no, no way. It's too difficult to read, and it cannot survive a rigorous examination. So we're awaiting for the professional publication from Scott Stripling and his team. Anyway, among the Dead Sea Scrolls, a very unique scroll was found in 1952 in Cave 3. The 13th item to be pulled out of that cave has come to be known as the Copper Scroll. Now, the Copper Scroll claims to be to giving a location of 64 different sites where thousands and thousands of objects of gold and silver have been hidden. Now, there are even a few folks today who have devoted their lives to trying to find these, this great treasure would be worth in the millions if it really existed. So that's the Copper Scroll. The story of the Copper Scroll and its unraveling and, inter and, and translation would be worthy of a podcast itself. The scroll was in a degraded form, rolled together, and difficult to unravel without destroying it. But it was finally done, and the first person to translate it was John Marco Allegro. He's been called the Maverick of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Very interesting character, and again, would make a great podcast just alone. Finally, wood, cloth, and wax. But for our purposes from understanding the earliest text of the Bible, we would concentrate on papyrus and parchment. So in a future episode, perhaps we'll get into those a little deeper. What are the important papyri that have been found? What are the important parchment that have been found? What text of the Bible do they include? What other texts do they include? in addition to biblical text. So much to study, much to learn. I will have links to many of these different subjects in, below in the description. So I hope you've been tantalized perhaps by what we talked about today to do some further study, investigation on your own. Please comment, like, subscribe, all that stuff, and we will see you in another episode.